Hi, I'm Jim O'Shaughnessy, and welcome to Infinite Loops. Sometimes we get caught up in what feel like infinite loops when trying to figure things out. Markets go up and down, research is presented and then refuted, and we find ourselves right back where we started. The goal of this podcast is to learn how we can reset our thinking on issues that hopefully leaves us with a better understanding as to why we think the way we think and how we might be able to change that to avoid going in infinite loops of thought. We hope to offer our listeners a fresh perspective on a variety of issues and look at them through a multifaceted lens, including history, philosophy, art, science, linguistics, and yes, also through quantitative analysis. And through these discussions, help you not only become a better investor, but also become a more nuanced thinker. With each episode, we hope to bring you along with us as we learn together. Thanks for joining us. Now, please enjoy this episode of Infinite Loops. Jim O'Shaughnessy is chairman and co-chief investment officer of O'Shaughnessy Asset Management, where Jamie Catherwood is an associate. All opinions expressed by Jim, Jamie, and podcast guests are solely their own opinions and do not reflect the opinions of O'Shaughnessy Asset Management. This podcast is for informational purposes only and should not be relied upon as a basis for investment decisions. Clients of O'Shaughnessy Asset Management may maintain positions in the securities discussed in this podcast. Well, hello, everyone. It's Jim O'Shaughnessy with another edition of Infinite Loops. I am super excited today because my new colleague, Vatsal Kushik, is joining me as a co-host. Welcome, Vatsal. Thank you, Jim. Super excited. And I'm also really excited about my guest, Rob Henderson. I've been reading him for quite some time. I think your stuff is amazing, Rob. And we're going to go through, I hope, all of it. But if you wouldn't mind, a little background, because your background is pretty unique in that you're kind of a bit of an Oliver Twist story. Ed, welcome. Thanks, Jim. It's great to be here. Hey, Vatsal. At the moment, I'm currently a PhD student here at Cambridge, England. Before this, I was studying at Yale University, where I got my bachelor's uh, in psychology. But before I found myself in these universities, my life was a lot different So to just back way up, I was born into poverty to a drug-addicted mother. My mother was an immigrant from South Korea. And shortly after I was born, my mother, her addiction became overwhelming. She succumbed to this. And I was subsequently placed into foster care, where I spent a few years in the Los Angeles County foster care system. I lived in seven different homes throughout my childhood. I was subsequently adopted to this sort of working class family in a small rural town in Northern California called Red Bluff. But after a couple of years, my adoptive parents got divorced and there was this ensuing custody dispute. I ended up living with my adoptive mother. My adoptive father, who I had grown pretty close to over those couple of years, he severed ties with me because he was upset with my adoptive mother for leaving him, which I took pretty hard because out of all the foster homes, I was mostly taken care of by women. And so he was like this first father figure that I had. To lose him was pretty devastating for me. So I lived with my adoptive mother. She was basically a single mom. We lived in a duplex. My mother, a little bit later, fell in love with a woman named Shelly. And they sort of formed this stable family environment for me for a few years into my adolescence. And that was a bright period of my early life. The summer before I was set to start high school, Shelly was shot basically like the sort of last straw in terms of my ability to care about my future or really care about myself. I got into a lot of trouble during high school. My grades plummeted, wasn't making the best choices. Somehow, miraculously, I ended up getting out of there. I enlisted in the military, joined the Air Force, left when I was 17. And that proved to be a good environment for me, provided the stability that I needed. After a few years of maturing and growing and learning, throughout that time, that's when I started thinking about my future and going to college and sort of entered as a mature student. The story in a nutshell, and I'm happy to go into any of that further if you want, but that's the snapshot version. Fascinating. We're just looking at probabilities here. You have really beaten them, given all of that in your past. What do you attribute that to? Was it some sort of Satori? Was it the military? What do you think? 
I mean, in terms of the statistics, you're absolutely right. I've actually looked into this, done some research and found that for foster kids in the U.S., only 3% of them end up graduating from college. The average in the U.S. is around 30 to 35% of American adults graduate from college. So one-tenth as likely. And for the bottom quintile, in terms of socioeconomic status, so sort of the poorest kids in America, about 10% of them graduate from college. So if you're poor, you're actually more than three times more likely to graduate from college than if you spend any time in foster care as a kid. So pretty dismal. As far as what helped me or sort of what made the difference, it was a lot of small things. I mean, definitely the military was probably the biggest factor by far. Talk to other people about this, other guys who had served and how the military changed their lives. And a lot of people point to things like discipline, the camaraderie, having good mentors. And I think all of those things are important. But even just sort of more prosaically, I think a big factor here, especially for young troublemaking kind of guys like I was, just having that structure and predictability was important. Just knowing that for every action, there will be a consequence. The discipline is inevitable. There's no getting away with anything. And you can maybe get away a little bit, but eventually like you're going to get caught. And so you really can't get into that much mischief in the military. Every aspect of your life is tightly regulated from your uniform, the way you make your bed. You can literally be thrown in jail if you don't show up to work on time. And everyone knows this. It's very clear up front. This will happen if you don't do this. Just knowing that was great for me. I mean, it was a very sort of almost prison-like environment. For someone like me, it was good, actually. I don't necessarily recommend that for everyone, but for someone like me who really didn't have much discipline and much oversight throughout my youth, just being in that environment is good. And I also think that even if you don't learn anything, there's still like study psychology, I study a lot of these sort of brain development and neuroscience. I think that the period for a young man from like basically the onset of puberty to like the early 20s are like the most dangerous period, the most dangerous person to other people and to yourself. To be in an environment where you can't really get into that much trouble for those years, even if you don't learn anything, basically pressing fast forward on those years. You enlist when you're 17 or 18, and then you get out when you're 22 or 24. When you get out at that age, you're less impulsive, you're more mature, you're less likely to get into trouble. Even if you don't learn anything, just being in that environment, I think is beneficial for a lot of young guys. And I saw it for myself, I saw it for a lot of other people as well. The other thing is just getting out of the chaos of my early life, talked a little bit about it, but just having the ability to step back from the disorder and the constant drama of what was going on around me, to just be able to take a breather and to live in an environment that wasn't so uncertain, precarious, advantageous as well. Just all of that predictability, like knowing that on the 1st and 15th, I'm going to get a paycheck, knowing that if I have a problem, I can go to this person, what my life is going to look like on Monday and Saturday and so on. All of these things that I think a lot of people just sort of overlook or don't think much about when you're someone who lived in a lot of dysfunction and deprivation, those things are hugely important. Yeah, I agree with you. I know all the stats. I study this stuff, too, as I think you know. One of the things that I was thinking about when I was reading your stuff over again was, do you think there could be some process, ex-military, for example, so we can't put everyone in the military, but do you think that there could be some kind of process that would actually work, that we could actually put into place to mitigate these horrible and dismal statistics? I've thought about this whether there could be some kind of national service, compulsory conscription, something like that. I think it could potentially work. I would like to see it tested, I guess, on a small scale first, any kind of national service starting out with certain states as an experimental trial. I keep track of some of this in terms of who enlists, the outcomes and qualifications and so on. Something like, if I'm not mistaken, seven out of 10 young Americans are not eligible to enlist for a variety of reasons. The number one is obesity, but there are other factors too, like drug use, tattoos. I think you can have, at least when I joined, this was back in late 2007, so the rules might be different now, but you could have tattoos, but it couldn't cover more than like 25% of a body part. But if you have like sleeves and you know face tattoos and neck, they're not going to let you enlist. Criminal background was another. A lot of young people, even if they wanted to enlist or wanted to join some kind of national service, I think some of the rules would have to be changed or updated, rearranged or something. I don't have any tattoos. And the reason for this is funny. I remember I talked to one of my older foster brothers and then I told him I wanted to get a tattoo. 
he had some and some of my other older foster brothers did too. And if you get a tattoo, it makes it easier for the police to catch you. The cops can catch you. And I said, well, what do you mean? And they said, well, if you have a tattoo and someone sees you, there's a witness, they can describe you by the tattoo and it makes it easier for the cops to find you. And I heard that and I was like, oh, I'm never going to get a tattoo then. <laughs> and so that little piece of advice as a little kid maybe helped me later on for when I ended up enlisting. That was one less thing I had to worry about. Uh, Rob, you brought this up in a few of your essays that we're seeing this shift where a lot more weight is being given to someone's credentials and position in the pecking order, while other more traditional virtues like a stable family have taken a backseat. And while you've written this probably from the perspective of the United States, I'm seeing this in India as well, especially in upper middle class and upper class families. My question is, is this trend dangerous? What could be the long-term consequences of this trend? I'm not sure. I'm concerned about it. The metrics that we look at are, are often misguided. So just speaking from the U.S. perspective and what I've seen and what I've read and experienced that so much of the discussion for young children, for example, it's kids who grew up in poverty or in some kind of disorder and stability. It's how do we get more of them into college? How do we get them good paying jobs? A lot of the discussion is centered on economics, which I think it's important. This is not unimportant. But if that's where all of our focus is, we're overlooking other factors. You know, we focus a lot on education and economics, and I think we overlook social and emotional factors for young children. There was a paper, I think it was either this year or last year, the lead author was James Heckman, the Nobel laureate, and he compared children's outcomes in Denmark and the U.S. And what he found was that the disparities between the most educated and least educated families, the parents, the outcomes for the children were roughly the same. Even though in Denmark, public assistance is widely available and college is free, the outcomes for the sort of bottom socioeconomic quintile for the children there are roughly the same as in the U.S. He stressed family factors, interactions with parents and children, having stability and secure homes and so on. And it wasn't discussed in the paper, but one thing that came to mind when I was reading that was just because there are opportunities available to a young kid doesn't mean they're going to leap at them. I remember when I was a kid, you know, I was being shoveled around homes every few months and I didn't care about school. I didn't care about reading. I didn't care about learning. I've either written about this or tweeted about when I was six, I was doing so badly in school. I couldn't read. There was a psychologist that came to one of my foster homes and she administered an IQ test and I got really low scores. My verbal was in the 80s. And this is because I just didn't care. <laughs> like, why would I read? Why would I care about my future? No one else seemed to. So why should I? And so, when we talk about all of this, you need like a minimum baseline of stability and a nurturing environment for kids before they can even consider taking those additional steps for their future, for taking advantage of those opportunities. So in a way, I think of families and stability and social emotional factors. I think of that as like a secure base from which kids can then take that next step towards thinking about education and thinking about what kind of career they want to have. It was just not a big factor in my life until after I became an adult and was in a stable environment. That's when I started to consider what I wanted to do in terms of my career, my profession, and those kinds of things. First, I had to get into a sort of position and I had to get into the right mindset before I could consider them. What's interesting about that to me is i have a junkie for this kind of research and controversial author Charles Murray, who wrote The Bell Curve, looks at this a lot. He did a piece on this. He excluded anyone but whites, so he didn't want to be called a racist, and he was comparing... He looked just at whites, right? Is that right? Yeah. He did that intentionally because his first book, The Bell Curve, included different races, and he was essentially canceled for 15 years for having the temerity to include that. But he wanted to really get at the gist of what the problem is. His conclusions were the same as yours. What had happened, and he looked at 1960, and I think the town that was working class was Fishkill or something like that, and then yeah, Fishtown, right? And then there was the rich town. In 1960, there was very little difference between marital rates, both parents at home, father working, et cetera, very few births out of wedlock. And this was true for the upper class and for the working class. Then he fast forwards and it's this huge explosion. Upper class, still two parents, still stable family, nuclear family unit, lower class destruction, literally. And one of the things that you talked about that I find really interesting is, first off, I'm going to ask you, can you define an elite for me? And then secondly, 
How much of this is due, and I love this notion that you come up with, to these sort of luxury beliefs that elites espouse because Veblen goods, anybody can get a Veblen good these days. So conspicuous consumption is gone. And so I like your thinking about, okay, so now we've got to have these luxury beliefs, which, by the way, I think are horrible, almost all of them. First off, what's an elite these days? How do you even define them? It's a thorny question. There's a lot of disagreement about this, too. I tend to favor Paul Fussell's characterization. Love him. Yeah. In part, that was my first introduction to this whole idea of social class in America and how pervasive it is and how it affects so many uh, factors of our social lives that we don't really think about. For the lower classes, they tend to define the upper class in terms of money, you know, how much money you have. If you have a lot of money, then you're considered an upper class or an elite. And the middle class tends to include education. So if you have money and you have the right educational credentials, then you're a member of this upper class or this elite. But the upper class, they say, you know, those things aren't enough. What really defines an elite is someone who has the right customs and mannerisms and tastes and habits. You have to like the right things. You have to speak the right language, the right vocabulary, use the right words, the way that you dress, where you eat, what kind of foods you like the music you listen to, all of those things. I think for the typical person, they may not necessarily include all of those. I mean, I think even Charles Murray offers a couple of definitions of elite. But generally, at least when I use the term, I tend to mean people who have gone to college and live comfortably and spend a lot of time on podcasts. So these are the mannerisms that I sort of include. You know, they listen to podcasts, they spend a lot of time on Twitter, they're reading, you know, whatever's on the New York Times bestseller list. They're the kind of people, they know what you're supposed to like. They know the luxury beliefs that you're supposed to espouse. They read newsletters, the media apps that update them on whatever the latest news is. They're the kind of people who keep up with the front page of the New York Times. I joke about this with a friend of mine. So a friend of mine, he was a former Marine, kind of similar background as me, went to college and now he's doing pretty well for himself. But he makes jokes about like how his coworkers, all of them have like the Bloomberg app on the phone and they very quickly scroll through it in the morning so that when they get to work, they can all sort of like, oh, did you hear about this? Did you hear about this latest news? Whatever, like so-and-so said this back during uh, when everyone's in the office. Elite for me is something like that. And of course, I think my definition has been largely influenced by my own experiences with them. I've had contentious discussions with my friends who say like, just because someone went to Yale or went to Stanford, that doesn't make them an elite. The real elites are the, you know, the oil CEOs, those guys, they're the real elites or something like that. And I think there's such a blinkered view. So when I was an undergrad at Yale, I met their mother was a doctor and the father was a lawyer and they grew up in very wealthy neighborhood, but they called themselves middle class because they don't have a private jet, something like that. And they have no idea that the median American income is something like $48,000 a year. The median income in Red Bluff, where I grew up when I was a kid, was something like that. This is the median household income was something like $27,000 a year. And so to hear people say like, oh, yeah, my family, you know, I think it's $500,000 a year, but that's middle class. We're scraping by. That just completely blew my mind. But in a way, I kind of get it because they're always this upward social comparison. You're always comparing yourself to people who are above you. You very rarely think about the people who aren't doing as well as you, which I think is kind of a mistake. Yeah, it's kind of like in group versus out group just seems to be part of our base human OS. People just can't help themselves. We had Luke Burgess on who wrote a book on mimetic desire, something I've studied a lot because of how I think it really affects markets, but it affects society as well, I think pretty clearly. I'm glad though that I don't qualify as an elite because I have been recommending that everyone not watch the news for the last decade because it's all propaganda, no matter which side you're on. I'll say something like this. People will come back, yeah, you're right. Fox is awful, but PBS is really good. <laughs> and I'm like, no, <laughs> different levels of propaganda. Let's move to your idea, which I think is really clever, of luxury beliefs. Can you give me some examples of luxury beliefs? I just wanted to say here that on this point of the media and, and social class, I didn't even really understand the importance of sort of keeping up with the media. I had a couple of awkward interactions as an undergrad at Yale where people would say, you know, did you hear about this piece of news? And I would say no, because I didn't read it. Then there would just be this sort of awkward silence. And I didn't really think much about it. But this happened a couple of different times. And it wasn't until later that I realized, oh, you're supposed to like know what's going on. And 
there was a reason why there were usually copies, like freely available copies on the campus of the Wall Street Journal, or the New York Times. And I think you get discounts for being a student and they try to indoctrinate you early, right? Like when you're 18 years old, it's like you get a 50% discount for the subscription. And I remember growing up as a kid, we never really talked about politics. I think my mom for a while subscribed to the local newspaper. It could be a factor of social media in terms of why media has become so pervasive and why we're talking so much about politics, for example. But I remember as a kid, it was very little of it. I think part of it is because when you're getting by, you're not thinking that much. You don't really have time to think that much about whatever the latest political topic is, keeping up with the latest trends. You're just trying to pay your bills and just regular things to worry about. As you sort of become more comfortable, you have more time to spend on politics and on media. I define luxury beliefs as ideas and opinions that confer status on the upper class while often inflicting costs on the lower classes. We've already touched on one example of this, which is this belief that the importance of family is not nearly as stressed when you actually look at the way that the upper class lives their lives. You'd alluded to this before that in 1960, the number of children who were raised by both of their birth parents in terms of upper class and working class families, it was virtually identical. It was 95%. It was very rare to see a kid who didn't live with their the mom and their dad in 1960. And then by 2005, for the upper class, it had dipped somewhat from 95% to 85%, but still the vast majority. And for the working class, it had gone from 95% to 30% by 2005, which is a massive drop off. I've written about this before about how, of course, like I've talked a little bit about my own situation, but my closest friends in high school, so I had three, there's a few of us, but my three closest friends, one of them was raised by a single mom who, at least from what I remember, I mean, she had sort of a new boyfriend who would call dad every six months or so, which was a new guy in his life, which wasn't good for him. And another friend of mine, his dad went to prison and his mom was addicted to drugs. She was sort of in and out of rehab, but he was raised by his grandmother. He passed away when we were in high school. And so essentially, like in the middle of high school, he was roughly on his own. My third friend, he was raised by his dad, but he had been raised by a bunch of different stepmoms. So his dad was compulsively marrying another woman every couple of years. And so by the time we graduated high school, he had been divorced five times different step siblings living in the house all the time, a different stepmom, just a different family arrangement. When I look at the outcomes for my friends, none of them went to college, a couple of them landed in jail, one of them was shot to death, a total divergence compared to what I saw for my friends in college. Every single one of my friends in college was raised by their parents. In one of my classes, my first year, I remember the professor took this anonymous survey there's a seminar of about 20 something students basically asking how many of us were raised by both of our birth parents. And out of 20 some students, only two, me and one other student said that we were not 90% plus of the students there. And that was not at all unusual. What I found kind of surprising actually is that even my former enlisted friends, a few guys who had served and they'd gone to college on the GI Bill, even they had been raised in a sort of intact middle class family. I found a little bit surprising because the military, you know, it's seen as sort of this more blue collar, maybe middle class environment, lower middle class, I guess more diversity in terms of family backgrounds compared to a place like Yale. But even even the guys who ended up going to Yale had that family background. I don't think it's a coincidence that if you come from a stable, secure background, family background, you end up getting into a pretty good school. But I want to stress that even this, in a way, is kind of a luxury belief, this preoccupation with getting into college. I think that even if it made no difference at all in terms of your educational prospects, I still think that it's good for kids to be sort of raised in a secure two-parent family, however that looks, but something that's predictable and stable and nurturing for kids simply because of the social and emotional consequences later on, not the educational and economic ones, but just what that does to a kid later, it's worth mitigating that. Another luxury belief, I don't know how how controversial we can get here. You can get very controversial. (laughs) (laughs) I actually just tweeted this, I think like a week ago. So I found a a YouGov survey, who is in support of defunding the police? And they broke this down by income for people who made, I think it was less than $25,000 a year. It was around 20%. For people who made between $25,000 and $50,000 a year, it was roughly the same, about 20%. But for people who made more than $100,000 a year, it was into the 30s, like 35% or something. And so basically, the group of people in the US who are the most in favor of defunding the police are the wealthiest Americans. Utterly insane. I mean, this is the definition of a luxury belief, because the people who are going to be paying the costs for fewer police or no police are going to be the poorest people, because they're the ones who are the most likely to be victimized by crime. 
have shared data, I think this is from the FBI, that compared to Americans who make $75,000 or more a year, the poorest Americans are seven times more likely to be victims of aggravated assault, seven times more likely to be victims of robbery, and 20 times more likely to be victims of sexual assault. And so if you're a poor person, you're much more likely to be affected in some way by crime. We have these categories of rich and poor and upper class and lower class. But then when you zoom in like on a more granular level, who are the victimizers? Who are the, the offenders robbing and assaulting people? Well, these tend to be young men. And then who are the victims? Well, it tends to be either elderly people or women. The people who are getting robbed tend to be elderly because they make easy targets. And of course, you know, in terms of sexual assault and so on, it's disproportionately women. And so we can talk about, you know, oh, the poor victimizing the poor. But then like when you zoom in closer, it's actually like young guys hurting the elderly and hurting women. And I think this is something that people at least claim to be concerned about protecting the most vulnerable people in our society. So I think this is a quite straightforwardly definition of this. It just is mind blowing. I read this article. You know, this was at the height, I think, of some of the protests and stuff that were going on. A lot of the wealthy people in the Northeast were vacationing in the Hamptons and going to more secluded areas in the midst of COVID and in the midst of all the social unrest that was going on. And this article was outlining like how much they had paid for private security and how they had private bodyguards. And basically, these people, the people who are most in favor of defunding the police are also the ones who are the most able to afford private security to hire the big guy with the earpiece. I guess the rest of us just don't get any protection at all. For me, it's a little bit personal because my family lives now they live in the Bay Area in California. There have been protests there. There has been a spike in crime. And my mother is like a small Asian woman. She's a uh, not going to be in the best position if crime starts to spike even more. So those are a couple there. Uh, we can get into more if you like. But over time, gradually saving ideas that I've had, what are these luxury beliefs? Another one, this proliferation of addictive technology. There have been interesting articles. I think I saw one in Newsweek, for example, about how a lot of the sort of tech tycoons who sell addictive technology are very strict in terms of how they monitor it in their own homes. Famous example of this, a lot of people know that Steve Jobs famously wouldn't let his kids have iPads. Bill Gates, I think he has like one family computer in his home when the kids were growing up. A lot of the schools, the private schools that the wealthy send their kids to, they're not allowed to have phones or they lock them away for the afternoon or something while the kids are, are studying. But meanwhile, the rest of us, these endless temptations, everywhere we look, the author, uh, Steve Helley, he has this book, How I Became a Famous Novelist. I think it's a fictional book, but there's this great passage in there about how basically modern writers should get way more credit than the writers of the past. Charles Dickens didn't have anything better to do than attend a public hanging and eat some mutton. Whereas today, if you're at your laptop trying to write something, you have all of these notifications going off, email, your phone, like everything is trying to get your attention. You have behavioral scientists funded by the wealthiest companies in the world trying to manipulate you into clicking this or opening that. Personally, I can feel that as a PhD student trying to write papers and it's just so tempting to open up Twitter or something. This in itself is also a luxury belief in a way. If a lot of this technology had existed when I was a kid, I, I kind of came of age right before all this took off. I don't know how my life would have gone if YouTube and all these things had been around. It would have been hard for me to resist. One of the things that strikes me is what do you think caused this disconnect? Because when I was growing up, the elites, in quotes, were seen as stolid, very hardworking, God and country, <laughs> all of these things that people aspired to. And I think actually was a good thing that they aspired to. So for example, I've long said that we now have the worst political class in my memory ever. And then you contrast that with George Marshall, who as Secretary of State decided, hey, you know what? Let's, instead of punishing Japan and Germany, what about rebuilding them? Maybe that might be a better idea. And then you start looking at the caliber of men and women who went into government service. And it was almost a foregone conclusion that if you came from the upper class and you had done well in business, you owed the government some service. Guys like George Marshall, et cetera, et cetera. And now, <laughs> call them Congress critters, have suggested that we make them wear uniforms like the F1 drivers so that we can know what companies have bought them. What do you think changed? Because these are crap beliefs. I'm especially sensitive to the second one you mentioned, 
about when I hear people, contemporaries of mine, who are quite rich, espouse like we should end the police. I look at them and I just, I literally say, are you insane? The only people who will suffer, it ain't us. It's going to be all the people who actually really need police protection. It just seems to me, how did we get so dumb? (laughs) Yeah. So one of the claims that I make in my writings about luxury beliefs is the way that social status has shifted away from material goods. So at least up until sort of the mid 20th century, when goods had become more affordable prior to that, goods were a much stronger indicator of your social position in society. It was much easier in the early 20th century to walk down a street of a major city and sort of just pinpoint just by how they look, who's rich and who's poor. Oh, that guy's rich, that person's poor. Thackeray's Vanity Fair, right? (laughs) <laughs> right. Yeah. It's much harder today. If you walk down the street of a major city, you can't necessarily pinpoint who's poor, who's middle class, who's rich, just by their appearance. And the way that people now indicate their social position in society is by having unusual or novel beliefs. I think this is dangerous because if you're a working class or blue collar person and you are closer to daily realities, you're not as insulated from it you basically have to have beliefs that are more aligned with reality, at least for certain kind of commonsensical beliefs, like maybe we should have some police around because occasionally bad people do bad things. But if you're insulated from that, one way to distinguish yourself from having that commonsensical conventional view is by expressing strange opinions that only someone who's insulated could express. I use this analogy of the handicap principle or the peacock's tail, borrowing from biology, It's almost like this costly signal of only someone who was educated at elite universities and is so sealed off from daily reality could have these sort of unusual or novel beliefs about how we should defund the police, how everyone else should be addicted to certain kinds of technologies. That's one aspect, I think, is the signaling component to it. The way that the signals have shifted from material goods to beliefs, the other part of that actually is that beliefs can more rapidly change. Material fashion is slow, constrained by the speed with which you could adopt a new look. This is out of fashion, but now I have to go buy these clothes and put these ones on. But for beliefs, you know, as soon as something takes off on Twitter, your political party's mainstream media outlets start saying, you know, here's the correct belief that you're supposed to have. Instantly, everyone gets the software update and, oh, that's what I'm supposed to believe now. And it can happen much faster in the age of social media. And there's something else here. And and this is something that I've been wrestling with because in many ways, I'm very grateful for the kind of system that we have because the way that my life has turned out, it is more meritocratic. I know there's a lot of debate about meritocracy and I know that we don't have a perfect meritocracy, but I think it is more meritocratic than it was in decades past when certain kinds of people were locked off because of the way they looked or the social class that they were born into. But this can create some kinds of instability too. You know, if you read some of Peter Turchin's work, Ages of Discord, and some of his his other ideas on intra-elite competition, in the past, when your social position was more secure in society, I think that you probably didn't have to worry as much about rivals undercutting you, simply because, you know, there were these rigid divisions between classes and between factions of elites. Whereas now, because things are more permeable and people can more quickly rise and fall, there's more anxiety among the elites and the aspirational elites. I mean, the amount of anxiety I saw both undergraduates and graduate students and people who have graduated from elite universities, it's something that was totally shocking to me because in my mind, I thought, once you get that admission letter to Yale, you've made it. You never have to worry about anything ever again. That's Willy Wonka's golden ticket. Like you're set, but that's not how it is. At least that's not how they treat it. That's how I treated it. Getting in was like step one for them. And then it's getting the right internship and getting into the right law school and getting the right job, getting into the right investment bank or whatever, because all of these people are in constant competition with one another, can also give rise to perverse and twisted kinds of beliefs as well and different kinds of opinions, because there's this sort of arms race to show that you are the most morally righteous, which is a kind of status currency now among the elite in a way that it wasn't necessarily that way in the past. So the other thing that is fascinating about this to me is this idea of signaling. And I just sometimes do wonder what happens if a certain group who we would consider elites, for example, started calling these people out. They started saying, are you insane? Are you really that stupid? I mean, hitting all those buttons, because I've always found that the most aspirational people are also the most nervous and anxious about how they appear to other people. 
I've been very lucky in my life in that I don't really give a fuck what anyone thinks about me. But I have seen and I watch it because it's just I can't help myself. It's just so fascinating. It's like anthropology in real time. Would that work, do you think? Do you think if all of a sudden there was like a group of people, like people really aspired to be like, and they were like, well, let's do a symposium and talk about how these beliefs of yours are utterly ridiculous. And why on earth are you maintaining them? Do you think that would have any effect or no? Yeah, I think it would. And I think to some extent it does. I've been thinking more about who influences society, who gets to decide what kind of things that we talk about. And I think, yeah, what you said, people who others aspire to be, people who hold whatever, the right status, the right position, credentials or whatever, for better or worse, that's just how society works, that if you want to be taken seriously, you have to sort of hit those markers. I think that we are seeing this to some degree. You'd mentioned some of the folks who've left their positions at media outlets and started their own sub stacks and the kind of influence that they're having. I think that's been very valuable. I've even been surprised at and somewhat dismayed at how people even listen to what I have to say. I'm thinking that like what I'm saying to me isn't that special or unique or interesting. I think I'm just kind of espousing roughly common sense with my own personal touch on it. But the way that people respond to it is just mind blowing. And I realize that maybe there is this sort of dearth of people who are espousing common sense related to luxury beliefs that common sense is actually kind of vulgar. It's gauche to say things that make perfect sense. If you want to be a member of the elite, you have to say things that are not common sense in a way. So I think it does work. I remember when I was at Yale during a period of great sort of campus unrest. There were a lot of student protests going on in the fall of 2015. So Jonathan Haidt, who you may have heard of, he's the social psychologist at NYU. He had come to give a talk at Yale. I emailed him after sort of like asking him about what he thought about what was going on. But he responded to me and he said, um, do you think that most students agree with what's going on with the protests and demanding that these professors be fired? Or do you think it's just a small group of dedicated activists who are pushing for this? I think it's just a small number, but everyone else is just keeping their mouth shut. So I don't know if that matters. Taleb's minority rule or the 10% rule or something that if you have a small number of dedicated people and the rest are just sort of passive and go along with whatever and they're not saying anything, then that 10% gets to dictate the terms of the conversation and what the norms are and what the rules are. And I saw exactly that play out. It was stunning to me. And so the more I reflect on the role of influence and who gets taken seriously and so on, there does seem to be this effect of if you have a belief, you should express it, especially if it challenges the elite conventional wisdom happens to be because there can be this domino effect. I've noticed that if I'm more outspoken about certain issues, I've noticed that other people are more willing to be as well. And that can be very important too. I think this was actually in the Luke Burgess's book, his book on automatic theory. He cites this political scientist where essentially one way that laws and norms can quickly get out of control is because people are silent and they're just passively going along with it, which is related to this other idea called the Abilene Paradox. For the listeners, so the Abilene Paradox the author of the idea, I think his name is Jerry Harvey. The scenario is there are three people who are trying to decide where to go for dinner. One of them suggests they travel, throwing this out as a suggestion. How about we travel to Abilene? The second person doesn't want to rock the boat, doesn't want to sort of create an argument, doesn't want to get in. So they just say like, yeah, sure, that sounds fine. We can go to Abilene. Person sees both of these two people suggest Abilene and thinks, oh, well, there's a majority. I don't want to go against the majority here. So I guess I should say like, let's go to Abilene. So now you have three people going to a city that none of them want to go to simply because one person suggested as an idea and no one else wants to speak out against it. And I think oftentimes we see that happening. So many people have talked to me about things that I've written here at Cambridge when I was a student as well at Yale, privately saying things like, you know, I really agree with that, or I really like the way that you put that, but they won't say anything publicly because they're afraid. But then once there's critical mass reached, more people will start to speak out. So yeah, it's kind of like the private knowledge, public knowledge. For example, privately, a lot of people knew Weinstein was a rapist and they would never speak out on it. And then some brave person, I think it was Rose McDonald in that case, called him out publicly on it. It's the emperor has no clothes. All of a sudden, everyone is like, yeah, and everyone piles in. One of the things that I enjoy doing is working with younger people to sort of help them along in their careers. And it's not just finance, it's all over. And one of the things that I have been most dismayed by is virtually anyone I'm working with under the age of 35, one of the first questions I ask them is, do you falsify your beliefs 
when you are with your friends. Preference falsification, I get a near 100% yes. And so I'll explore that with them and I'll say, why do you do that? And the answers are much like you, the paradox. They want to fit in. They don't want to be shunned. I think, again, if you study evolutionary biology and psychology, this is deep within the human program code. Being shunned, being put out of the tribe for almost all human history was a death sentence. A lot of it is going to take us time, I think, to get over. But one of the things I'm excited about is in this whole idea of this great reshuffle, I think you're going to see a lot of changes. And you mentioned one of them. When really good thinkers can go off and do a substack or do research like you're doing and put it out there and aren't afraid to put it out there, it will slowly, I think, rise to the top. We talk about a meritocracy. I believe we are going from the physical universe to the digital universe. I believe we're going from a scarcity mindset to an abundance mindset. In the physical universe, it takes a certain amount of time to build a house or landscape something, what have you. In the digital universe, your leverage is incredible. But I think that leverage also exists for ideas. I think that In that universe, the ability for people to find an idea, contemplate it, think about it, start discussing it, as I put it to one of my mentees, ease into it. (laughs) In other words, try it out. One guy I was working with, I said to him, I can't remember what it was. It was something really silly. When you're with your friends, have you ever just said, hey, does anyone else think that this is kind of dumb? And he was like, I can't do that. Anyway, after we worked together for a while, he came on the Zoom and he was really excited. He was like, Jim, I tried it. And everyone was like, finally, finally. It turned out his entire group believed that same thing. He said, now I'm addicted to it. It's like, I'll go in and I'll say. (laughs) But I think this idea of the Overton window and who decides what gets discussed, I think it's getting degraded. There are just so many competing platforms. Your work, I've read all of your work, and I find it compelling. You have a platform. I don't know that you would have had a platform in 2005. I don't think you would have, actually. In this world, geography no longer matters. That's really good news, I think, for the vassals of the world. It might not be such great news for people like Americans One of the other things I wanted to ask you about was this whole idea of how is victimhood sexy in any way? It seems to me that I'm a victim. I mean, if you really want to program yourself to fail, you declare yourself a victim, you blame someone else, you surrender all of your agency, you're done. As far as I'm concerned, you're just not going to make it. I'm a rational optimist. And I think that I see a lot of trends that I think are actually quite good for this emotional plague that we've been living through to end. Of course, there are problems. We've given up religion and politics is the new religion. My only tendency is to be fiercely anti-authoritarian. So I don't have a political party because a pox on both of them for wanting to have everyone just dip down into ideology and dogma. That's the death of thought as far as I'm concerned. It almost seems to me to be like, oh, you know what I want to do? I'm going to have inflexible beliefs. I'm going to become a non-player character so that I can fit in. I mean, that is so fucking crazy to me. But I'm now in this environment where I find people like you, like Batzel, and loving it. Because there are so many good ideas now we can talk about. Now that people can self-select and listen to this podcast and think it over and think, huh. That's really interesting. I think that the new period we're moving into, hopefully, hopefully, will lead to more of that and not less. That's all. Actually, I'm going to let you ask this question because the media overlay here becomes important. And I would love to get Rob's take on that. You just told us that being rich financially is not enough to be a part of the elite class. And TV shows help you realize that there are other boxes that need to be checked if you want to get into the elite class. 
I was wondering if social media, Twitter, Instagram, TikTok has now taken over TV shows or movies as the main medium of that identity change or do TV shows and movies still remain the primary source of that shift? Interesting. I got to say that I'm not on TikTok. My younger sister taught me how to use Instagram fairly recently. Twitter's been like my main platform. So I wrote a long form essay in the New York Times, but then I, I published the uncut version, which is much longer on my newsletter. For me, TV played a huge role in helping me to understand what are the alternative kinds of lives that I could possibly lead. And even though it took me a while to get there, the images that I saw had remained with me into my early adulthood as I considered uh, education and so on, what social class was. I don't think it would have necessarily the same kind of class markers or the same class cues. TikTok videos are so fast. And the sort of trends that they portray seem to be so much more fleeting. I think class is a little bit more enduring than that. I guess I would have to say I'm not entirely sure. I think that for now, at least, things could be changing. But I think for now, TV shows and movies, they have a cultural cachet that is still stronger than social media and some of these platforms. I think like a lot of influencers, say, on Instagram are trying to leverage that into a TV deal or a movie deal. But very few people are trying to make a movie with the hopes of becoming an Instagram influencer. So there's still this step that you have to take. And it's still considered more prestigious to be in a Hollywood film or something than to be on social media. I did just hear this interesting article. I think it was in a foreign policy about this uh, Instagram influencer who had taken uh, some kind of job as like a sports journalist, no real qualifications to do this, except having a couple million followers on Instagram or something, got this job and tweeted about it. She got ratioed tons of negative comments on her tweet from graduates of elite journalism schools saying, you didn't even study this. And I went to the top school and you're getting a job and I don't have this job. That's not fair because people are still stuck in that old mindset. You have to sort of follow that traditional path in order to be successful. But things are changing now. We could see um, becoming an influencer at some point actually being more important than having those traditional markers of status. That's another really interesting topic to me because I definitely think, I'm all in favor of going to college. For example, my daughter graduated from Yale in 2010. So I know a lot about Yale. And my other two kids graduated from Notre Dame at various years. So obviously, they went to really great schools. I would almost say that the socialization factor of being able to attend one of those universities is far more valuable than the degree itself. I'm certainly not telling people not to go to college, but I don't think in this new era, a degree is an accreditation, in my opinion, that suggests competence. Whereas Vatzel, for example, I watched him for, I don't know, nine months on Twitter, and he was auditioning every day, even though he didn't know it. His actual work product and output was what made me offer him this position as my colleague on Infinite Loops. I see that happening more and more and more. So you're going to have double power if you've got an elite degree and also are actually competent. <laughs> <laughs> Those two things don't always go together. No, they don't. No, <laughs> I know they don't. <laughs> Boy, do I ever know that. I think that the challenge, as I kind of think about this, is, listen, this whole great reshuffle, there's going to be a lot of casualties as well, in my opinion. For example, I changed my opinion on universal basic income. I had been opposed to it. I'm no longer opposed to it. I know that the stats do not bear me out here. I know that where it has been tried, and I know exactly what the legacy media will do. They will find that 5% that uses it to buy dope and <laughs> smoke dope, and they will feature them. But I honestly think that we have to have some mechanism within society to have a smoother glide path. And this is important to me, who through no fault of their own, that isn't the way their mind works, whatever, that we can't just abandon them. And I don't think of this as a conservative or a liberal point of view. It's been proposed by both. One of the original proposals was, hey, we should have America Inc., and if you are have the good fortune to be a citizen, either by immigrating here or being born here, 
you should be able to enjoy the fruits of this wonderfully free country and all that it does. So I think in terms of one of my worries is that when times are very, very chaotic, one of the things that you see if you study history is very sharp rise in conspiracy theories. And you see that because people crave certainty. And as you outlined in our earlier chat, certainty is really important for a lot of people, especially when they're growing up. But it, in many cases, is an illusion of certainty, I think. When a lot is going on <laughs> and things are speeding up and getting very, very complicated, people want simple answers. And so that leads to simplistic thought. It leads to all this nonsense that you see on the various conspiracies. And I get that. Maybe you could help me. You're a great mind. Is there a way to not only mitigate that, but actively get people to say, hey, maybe I should rethink this? Is this just too crazy? I've shared some of the stats posted some of them on Twitter and written about how trust in all institutions has been declining all throughout the 20th and 21st centuries for both political parties, by the way. Of course, there's like small differences, like whenever one of their favorite candidates is in power, they have a little increase in trust and then the next guy gets elected and it goes down. And But by and large, the overall trend line is sharp in terms of trust in the government, trust in media, trust in one another. I mean, the youngest Americans, it's something like they're more than twice as likely to say that most people can't be trusted compared to uh, Americans who are over 65 years old. I think it's something like for millennials and Gen Z, 60 to 70% of them say most people can't be trusted. Whereas for people who are over 65, say something like 25 to 30% are more likely to say that. So basically trust is declining overall, especially among young people. I'm not sure what exactly what's accounting for this and how to mitigate it. One idea that I thought was pretty interesting was from uh, the economist Tyler Cowen, who runs the Marginal Revolution blog. He discussed how the general idea is that more information is always better and transparency is always good and so on. But he suggested that actually, if you see too much, this can actually instill some degree of cynicism. And I think one example of this is social media. I mean, when I see the way that politicians and journalists and establishment figures interact with each other and the things that they post online, probably the most prominent famous example of this was our last president. The behavior of it was just so odious, undignified. And so if you're like a 15-year-old kid seeing how your nation's leaders and the most influential and powerful people are behaving online, how are you supposed to trust them? <laughs> like, how do you trust that this person is going to do the right thing in a crisis or an emergency? The rapid turnaround, to, I mean, like what we saw throughout the pandemic, the messaging on masks, for example, was just a total disaster. One minute the CDC is tweeting this and then the next they're saying that. And there's just a lot of inconsistencies there. And I don't think a lot of it, it's, it's not necessarily malice, but people who are distrustful are quick to read malice into all of this. They don't trust them. They think there's some kind of sinister agenda going on. I think that one possible small step to mitigate it would be like if there was a way to encourage people, especially people who are in influential positions, to think more carefully about what you're about to tweet or if you're tweeting from your sort of verified blue check official account. I know people would hate this idea. This is throwing it out there. If the sort of algorithm or something could read your tweet for you and then just say, like, are you sure you want to post this? as the CEO of this company or as a senator of this state? Are you sure you want to post this? And then if you say yes, it'll post. But just that one little small second, you know, a little bit of added friction before you make a fool of yourself or degrade the position you were trusted to hold. I think that could be one. I mean, yeah, if I saw a lot of this going on when I was 13, I mean, I was already a little shithead if I had seen what was going on, it would have been way worse. Because in the back of my mind, I thought there were still adults running the show. But now it's like, are adults running the show? I'm not sure. Maybe, maybe not. Yeah, I agree with that. I always joke that I have a Twitter prevention team 24-7 that physically knocked the phone out of my hand. I like your thought about the one second delay, because that could be quite helpful. Just a moment's pause. It's like, do I really want to do that? I cannot tell you the number of tweets that I start and then stop. Am I really going to do this? No, I'm not going to do that. I think that also this idea of 
the political class, the journalistic class. Listen, all of our old hierarchies, in my opinion, are crumbling. That doesn't mean that we're going to go Mad Max here. It means, in my opinion, that new ones will emerge slowly, sometimes not slowly, to take advantage of this chaotic mess in terms of the political class. For example, I'm actually worried about the political class being able to catch up. They are so far behind us in terms of what's happening in the private sector and in technology and cultural evolution that they are trying to manage to a world that stopped existing in the early 70s, in my opinion. And I think that one of the things that we got wrong was we looked at this period between 1946 and, say, 1976, as that was the norm. No, it wasn't. That was the exception. There was a reason why America was bestride the world. We won World War II, and we decimated all of our competitors. And so in 1958, I think 85% of the cars sold worldwide were sold by Detroit, which created this huge middle class, which created good jobs, which created all of these conditions for what many people look back on as, well, that's America. No, it's not. I mean, go back to the 19th century, and you'll see a very different America. I think we get fixated on something which is a bit of a chimera. We need to understand life is change. Is everything that's going to happen during the Great Reshuffle good? No, absolutely not. But I think that enough of it is going to be really good that allows people like yourself, like Batzel, like others who have demonstrated an ability to bring value. I think that that's a very good thing. Final topic I want to talk about a little bit. Batzel and I were joking around. We talk once a week, and I was talking about the idea that I was actually talking about George Marshall with him and how America finally got the idea, the right idea, in my opinion, that empires were bad. (laughs) In other words, physical empires, where you went, you displaced local populations, you took their goods, very mercantile system. And America was like, yeah, no, we don't want to do that. We want a cultural empire. We want to export ideas. And I had sent him, or you had found, that's all I can't remember. You sent it. Yeah, the Rammstein America video. I don't know if you've ever seen that, Rob. Yes, I have. Okay, so what do you think? Do you think that we're still exporting these cultural ideas? I think you do, because I know the last piece I read of yours, you think we're exporting some pretty bad ones. Yeah, well, the story there, so this was last year. I'd written a bit about cancel culture, a couple of different pieces, I think in City Journal and Psychology Today. And this media outlet from the Netherlands approached me talked to a Dutch friend of mine, I asked him, you know, is this legit? Should I talk to this person? And my friend said, like, oh, that's one of the biggest online media outlets in the Netherlands. And I said, okay, so I responded to this journalist who was putting together a video, asking people their thoughts on cancel culture. He and I talked for a few minutes, and I shared my thoughts. Mostly, I think it's bad. He put the video online a few days later, the journalist, and it went out live on their website, and it collected somewhere in the neighborhood of almost 200,000 views, which for the Netherlands is really big because they have quite a small population. Then my Dutch friend, I sent it to him and he you know, sent it to all of his friends in the Netherlands. And then he got back to me a couple of days later and was like, hey, this video was taken down. Do you know what's going on here? And I saw that it was taken down. I emailed the journalist and the journalist replied to me saying, my boss decided to take it down. Basically, they said that it was too sympathetic to the victims of cancel culture that it questioned cancel culture too much and it was not in support of it. And that was basically the main reason why they took it down. I wrote this piece basically saying, you know, a video questioning cancel culture has been canceled. And I talked to my friend. So he's a PhD in sociology doing a postdoc now. And he told me, you know, this kind of thing would have been unthinkable a few years ago in the Netherlands, this idea of putting a video up doesn't have the right belief or the right point of view. And so now we have to take it down. This is a very American thing. And so my general claim here is that we used to export culture, as you said, we exported blue jeans and Elvis and Hollywood movies. And now 
people were exporting luxury beliefs, we're exporting cancel culture, we're exporting what beliefs are proper to have, what you're supposed to think about things, about political or social or moral issues. It's really, to me, I think it's a, not a good export. But what we used to export was better. To see the kinds of influence that we're having now is a pretty disappointing thing. I had this conversation, actually, this was a few years ago with this young woman. Uh, I think she was from Romania. I asked her, you know, what do you think of America? And, you know, a lot of Eastern Europeans have a completely different view. Them and their families still have memories of communism and totalitarian regimes and so on. America is the dream. This is a wonderful country. A lot of people would love to move there, Romanians. They love it. And... That was much different than a lot of conversations I had with people from Western Europe and a lot of people I speak to here here in the UK. The views of America are shifting and, and turning into a more negative direction in a lot of ways, which is pretty disappointing. I think that we could do a lot better. Yeah, I agree. I think that what you need to do is just do it. You need to have people like you on a podcast. You need to hire people like Vatsel. You need to walk the walk. And I think that that has small, incremental changes, but it's kind of like compounding. You never want to interrupt positive compounding because it's very slow and you don't notice anything. You don't notice anything. You don't notice. And then all of a sudden you own all the rice in the world. I actually had that exact experience with my Twitter account, actually, which I just started posting some book excerpts and some random thoughts. It was a slow sort of trickle and then after about a year, year and a half, it suddenly started getting a lot of attention and being retweeted by bigger and bigger accounts. I never expected that. It was almost like, oh, this is a place where I can go to catch up on all of the cool excerpts that I've been reading and to remind myself of all the cool stuff that I've been looking at. And then to see that other people were following it and responding to it was just pretty unreal. And then a similar thing happened with my newsletter. I think there is like this craving for alternative points of view outside of, you had mentioned the legacy media, people who are we're thinking about issues in different ways. There's a lot of curious people out there. That has been actually gratifying to see, and it gives me a lot of hope. Yeah, I agree on the curiosity. I think that attention is the new gold. I think if you don't understand that, you're not going to do very well. And the clickbait farms, all of that, with the dopamine hits, you've just got to be brutal. I mute I joke about it with Vetzel all the time. I mean, if you saw my mute list on Twitter, I don't block unless they're just some horrible troll. And luckily, I don't seem to attract too many horrible trolls. But I've gotten so used to mute, 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 just because the curation aspect. I personally think Twitter has what it takes to become the world's first global intelligence network. It's going to really take a lot of curation because there's tons of noise. It's a very noisy app. Also, I've met some of the smartest people I've ever met in my life on Twitter. You got to take the next step, which is talking. And then if you can do it, the next step, meeting them in real life. And suddenly you have this incredible network of people. Now, I was lucky beforehand and that I had one of those anyway. But being able to add to it, and especially for young people, I think it's a great way, if you just approach it the right way, you can do things. This too shall pass. And if you study history, there have been all sorts of horrible, horrible periods in history. And I think sometimes we need to remind ourselves that things have actually, I mean, just statistically, never been this good in terms of world poverty is declining. I mean, billion people have emerged from poverty in the last, I don't know, 15 years. I travel a lot. And some of the happiest people I ever met were in Bhutan. I was just looking at pictures of these kids who came up and talking about Americans. Are you American? And they love Americans. And these kids are coming out of villages with no electricity, with the biggest smiles on their faces. And I'm just like, this is awesome. We made some friends there. And I heard, I got an email, you know that village? Electrified. One of the problems I think Americans have, in particular Americans, is America is so big, and if you don't travel extensively, you don't really understand how much weight America carries in the psyche of the rest of the world. In my opinion, that is a duty. We have a duty 
to understand that and try to at least get people you know, focused to, hey, isn't it cool that 100,000 people aren't dying of explosive diarrhea? I was shocked even myself. So I love Africa. I was in Nairobi and I started noticing all of these posters of George W. Bush. And I'm like, okay, become very friendly with the guy. And I'm like, you got to explain this to me. What is going on? He was not the most popular president in the United States. And he goes, oh, he's a hero in Africa. And I was like, why? And he goes, AIDS. He released all of the AIDS cocktails for free. He saved thousands, hundreds of thousands of life. As an American, I didn't know that. And yet you're in Nairobi, there's all these posters of George Bush. And if you're curious, you're going to put two and two together. That's the kind of America that I would love to see more of. Similar story, my girlfriend, she's here with me, but her family lives in Malaysia. And we had recently read that the U.S. had basically just donated a ton of free COVID vaccines to Malaysia. You know, no one knows about this. This wasn't really widely covered, but the U.S. is apparently giving like tons of free COVID vaccines to developing countries. And sometimes I think that this confidence that is lacking in American citizens, because we don't know about these things, we're constantly criticizing and self-criticizing. Like I know like America has a lot of problems and a lot of challenges that you need to address and so on. But we do a lot of good things too. Can we get a little bit of credit and a little bit of coverage and understanding that it's not 100% evil. Sometimes there are good things that happen. And, and it's something that I think that no one doesn't like that. When Americans hear about stories like that, they feel good about it. We don't think like, well, why do they get the vaccines? Why don't we get some vaccines? Those are our vaccines. No one thinks that way. No one thinks like, wow, that's a really good thing. Like, that's nice that we're actually doing that. And they're kind of surprised because no one expects America to do nice things. It reminds me, I saw this interesting stat. Uh, this is about the show, Who Wants to Be a Millionaire? And what they found, so there's the famous lifelines. One of the lifelines is asking the audience. If you're stuck on a question, you can ask the audience for help. And in the US, more than 90% of audience members report they give the right answer. If they see someone who needs help and they know the answer, 90% of them say, try to give them the right answer. They asked the same question in Russia. So the Russians have a similar version of who wants to be a millionaire. And it was something like less than 30% of Russians give the right answer. And the reason why, according to the author's interpretation of the statistic, which is that there's this culture of not wanting others to be successful, underlying envy which may be a holdover from communism and the brutality and impoverishment that they've lived through and so on. But it's just a completely different mindset. Americans like seeing other people succeed, want to help others. That's not a universal by any means. There are other cultures who don't necessarily enjoy witnessing others take things that they don't have or have things that they don't have. Usually American in some ways. I think it is. And I think that's another soapbox of mine. We still, despite everything, the brightest people in the world, for the most part, want to live and work in America. And we should let them as kind of a basic first step. If somebody gets a STEM degree from an American institution, we should staple a green card to it. Because, listen, it's pretty straightforward. Rule of law, freedom of speech, these are very conducive to creators creating. I think that some more on the positive end, I always try to feature it. But, of course, evolution made us very, very, very sensitive to novel dangers. It's just part and parcel. I think we'll move ahead, but this has been fantastic. I want to have you back on after your book is published. When is the book due out? There's no set publication date, but probably late next year. Yeah, I got to submit the manuscript here pretty soon. So that's been my main project over the last year. Terrific. I love to hear your writing. Okay, so we have a question that we ask at the end of every podcast which we think is kind of fun. And some of the answers I've really just loved. We're going to make you the emperor of the world for one day. Okay. You can't kill anyone. You can't send anyone to a re-education camp, but you can incept ideas in them. They are going to think when they wake up the next day, they're not going to think, oh, Rob told me to do that. They're going to think that they thought that they should do this. What two things are you going to incept in people? So one thing to cultivate and maintain your, your relationships with other people. This is overlooked across the social classes, but for different reasons. Among the people that I'm around now, I think a lot of them are so focused on material and professional success 
that they're not really connecting with the people around them. And then I think in but the guys that I grew up with, yeah, they have this individual mindset or this mindset that they don't need anybody else, which I think holds a lot of people back too from becoming successful. I mean, one of the things that helped me a lot going back to the start of this conversation, another thing that had helped me was being willing to ask for help to connect with other people and maintain those ties over the long term. So that's one, maintaining relationships. I'm not sure that I have a, an answer for the second one necessarily. I mean, maybe just back on my soapbox from earlier about families and, and so on, before you have kids to just like really make sure that you're prepared for it. And this is actually an idea that I took from Dr. Drew Pinsky. I've talked to him on his podcast as well, that once you have children, it's not really about you anymore. It's about them. So every decision you make, it's not about sort of maximizing your own happiness. Every decision should be more about how can I ensure that this kid has a good outcome? And again, sort of emotionally and socially, not just professionally. Yeah, I love that one. I believe that very, very deeply. And I've been very lucky in my life because I not only have three great children, I have all of their spouses. I mean, what are the odds? I like them all. And I even like their families. Good Lord. And I have three beautiful grandchildren. On this family issue, you know, my sister is experiencing this now, something that we hadn't really thought about before her and I were talking about this. If you have divorced parents and your romantic partner has divorced parents, then holidays become an absolute mess because that's four families. That's four families and none of them can be around each other. There's a lot of exes and bad blood and people who don't want to be in the same room with one another. Thanksgiving, Christmas, New Year's, all of these things, the logistics of it become impossible. And this actually creates a little bit of resentment and hostility about like, why do we have to sort of organize our lives because you guys couldn't figure this out earlier? Yet another thing to think about when you start thinking about families. Yeah, very lucky because my wife and I were very simpatico. We got married as children. We were 22. And then we thought, well, okay, so we're crazy. We might as well have our son, Patrick, at 24. But we literally did discuss, I mean, what are our objectives here? What we alighted on was we wanted to raise good adults. And if you think about that, if that's your line of code, it precludes all sorts of behaviors that are natural. For example, you can't look at your child and say, because I said so, because you're living under my roof, because I am the one who makes the laws here. That's the way you treat a good adult. So a lot of this sort of natural instincts. When you have that as your governing rule, you can't do it. What happens is the child learns that they have a voice and that even if you're offering a false choice, I used to joke with my kids, you get to choose. You can do it the easy way or the hard way. (laughs) And the idea was I always tried to present things to them as a choice for them. Also, if they wanted to do something or not do something, I would say, sure, tell me why. And critical thought, oh, I need to think about this. And just that kind of one rule really, at least in our case, worked out really, really well. So I agree with you, though. I think that it's not for nothing that one of the common things, if you study religions, for example, what do you think that almost every religion tries to do? Oh, I mean, I'm just thinking about sort of enforcing certain rules and taboos. They try to separate children from their parents. Oh, right. Because they want to be mommy and daddy. Steven Pinker has a great book on this called The Blank Slate. It's probably also how many terrorism organizations work. Oh, fascinating. Yeah, I've seen this with ideologies, too. I mean, lately, I've been on this kick about reading about the sort of history of communist movements in Maoist China and Soviet Union. And it's religion, it's ideology, it's the movements don't want to compete with parents for the loyalty of children, right? I mean, it's understandable from the point of view of the ideology, but it's also something to keep in mind sort of as we go forward and we see certain movements take off and how much they want to sort of influence children and parents. A couple of good books on that, The Weirdest People in the World. It's academic, and so I hesitate, but I keep going back to it, so I did recommend it. Eric Hoffer, are you familiar with his work? Well, just The True Believer is the only one I'm, yeah. That was the one that was the one I was going to recommend. So Eric Hoffer, I mean, talk about meritocracy. He was a longshoreman who literally became one of the best-known philosophers of his era. Yeah, that book's only like 150 pages long, and that just totally rocked my world. It's amazing. Yeah, totally transformed. Amazing book. Well, listen, 
This has been absolutely delightful. You are a great guy, and I can hardly wait to read your book. This has been a lot of fun. Thank you for coming on. What degree are you getting from Cambridge? Just psychology, but my specialty is evolutionary and social psychology. I'll probably be back in the U.S. right around this time next year, hopefully, maybe a little bit later. And if you're in New York, uh, let me know. We'll have lunch or whatever. Sounds great. Thanks. Thanks, Jim. Thanks.